All right. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And thanks so much for joining today's Breathing Policy Forum. My name is George Habib, and I'm the President and CEO of the Lung Health Foundation. We began the Breathing Policy Forum series three years ago because we saw so many gaps and challenges facing our healthcare system that needed to be addressed. And addressing gaps and inequities is key to our mission. These forums have allowed us to bring together different health experts and thought leaders from across the country to facilitate discussions on some of the most urgent issues facing healthcare today. Today is the second of a three-part series focused on COVID-19, marking an exciting new partnership between the Lung Health Foundation and McMaster's University's Global Nexus for Pandemics and Biological Threats. This partnership has allowed us to provide Canadians with evidence-based, timely information on COVID-19 vaccine efficacy, infectious respiratory diseases, and other public health measures put in place to manage risk and improve people's health. In addition to this, we are collaborating to advance policy recommendations and solutions to decision makers for some of the most major issues associated with COVID-19. In today's discussion, panelists will investigate how Canada and governments reacted to the pandemic and what economic and social policies were conducive to stopping the spread of COVID-19 and ensuring the well-being of citizens. We know that when the pandemic hit, countries across the globe were faced with difficult choices about the best way forward. Some put in place tight containment and confinement measures, and still doing that today, and they did it early on and implemented economic policies to mitigate the impact of their populations. Others took slower methods and discounted warnings about the dangers of the virus. One thing we know for sure is that COVID-19 affected certain communities in catastrophic ways. In Canada, data suggests that COVID-19 cases were one and a half to five times higher among racialized populations with the economic impact of the virus also being far worse for racialized and low-income groups. Today's conversation will touch on all of these topics as panelists reflect on government responses and deliberate on how these responses might be improved in the future, or deliberate, sorry, on how these responses might be improved in the future. Now, before I turn it over to our moderator, I'd like to thank our three panelists, Dr. Michael Wilson, Dr. Stephen Hoffman, and Dr. Shandrima Chakraborty. We're very fortunate to have these three researchers with us today uh, who are leading the way in Canada's COVID-19 research and evidence response. Now, and I'm gonna abbreviate, uh, Heather, your uh, introduction because of time. Uh, without further ado, it's a pleasure to introduce today's moderator. I will say that Heather is the publisher and vice president of business development at iPolitics and Queen's Park Briefing. She also currently serves as the president of World Press Freedom Canada. And without further ado, let me uh, turn it over to Heather Bauer. Thank you, George. Uh, and my apologies to everyone for the tech uh, difficulties during the pandemic, which we have often uh, uh, seen play out in real time. Uh, anyway, it's my pleasure to be here to moderate today's event. I think what I'd like to do is just introduce our panelists by their key area of expertise and what they'll bring to the discussion and then turn it over to them to give their proper introduction on their areas of expertise. And then we'll launch right into the questions followed by a QA. and a uh, so, uh, Steve, we've met before and you've agreed that, uh, sorry, Stephen, we've met before and uh, you gave me kind of the overview of what your area of expertise is. Uh, scientific Director at the Canadian Inst Institutes of Health Research, uh, Institute of Population and Public Health. You're an expert in determining the health of individuals, communities and global populations. Could you, would you like to uh, elaborate on that at all, Stephen? Sure, uh, Heather, uh, thanks so much. And a big thanks um, to the organizers for inviting me to be part of this discussion. Um, really looking forward to it. So my work uh, at the Canadian Institutes of Health Research is very much focused on um, uh, really about ensuring that uh, public health research uh, can be done and is done in a way that's excellent and that can protect Canadians and people around the world 
from threats to our health. So public health is really all about the way that um, societies come together to collectively tackle challenges, whether it's a pandemic like what we're currently experiencing, or whether it's um, about uh, the health of our environments or ways um, upstream social determinants of health, like education and income. And so today I'm really excited to be bringing more of a global perspective. Um, my own area of work is in the area of global health research. And uh, during the pandemic, I've been very uh, involved in trying to coordinate among different research funding agencies about how to mount uh, as rapid as possible a scientific response to the pandemic, like what we're going through. So very much looking forward to bringing that global perspective to this panel. Thanks, Andrew. Well, we're very grateful to have you, Stephen. And when you have a once in a year, a hundred year crisis like this, I guess your life work really, really does apply. Uh, I would like to also introduce Dr. Michael Wilson. Uh, he's the Associate Professor, De Professor, Department of Health Evidence and Impact at McMaster University. He's an expert in the glo global stock of research evidence relevant to health systems policy making. Uh, Mike, I hope I got that right. Uh, could you please elaborate on that for the audience? Sure, thanks Heather, Heather and thanks for everyone for having me. Uh, yeah, so my work really focuses on um, uh, through the McMaster Health Forum and through my role at the university in helping decision makers at all levels, so government policymakers, organizational leaders, professional leaders, citizen leaders, in finding and using research evidence to respond to pressing policy issues. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, I've done a lot of work with a group called COVID End, which is the COVID-19 evidence network to support decision making to respond to senior government requests on pressing COVID issues with evidence syntheses of the best available evidence. So we'll talk a little bit about that today and some of the key insights we've, we've uh, garnered from, from some of the reports that we've done. Thank you very much, Mike. And Dr. Chandrima Chakraborty is a professor uh, in the Department of English and Cultural Studies at McMaster University. She is an expert in humanities who specializes in minorities and nation building, so the structural determinants of health. Uh, Chandrima, would you like to elaborate on that for the audience? Sure. Thank you, Heather. Uh, this is a pleasure to uh, join you, and I'm delighted to be invited to this panel. Uh, as Heather says, I am you know, really interested in questions of uh, storytelling, how certain stories of the pandemic might be told or not told, how do they become part of the public memory, how we will remember the pandemic. And I am looking at the differential effects of the pandemic on racialized communities uh, in the context of East Asian Canadians, South Asian Canadians, and also religious minorities in India. And I'm working on a co-edited book on COVID-19 and anti-Asian racism. And I am uh, one of the research co-leads for Canada's Global Nexus for Pandemics and Biological Threats. So thank you for inviting me. That's great, Chandimur. Thank you very much. So I think we're going to have a pretty uh, wholesome discussion here between the expertise of the three of you. Uh, let's start off with the evidence-based uh, science on this. And I think it's safe to say that uh, uh, countries need to be able to mobilize evidence-based scientific research quickly during a health crisis. So Mike, uh, taking an evidence-based approach yourself to the COVID-19 response, can you just share what you think has worked, not what you think, what you know has worked in Canada based on the evidence and what could have gone better? Sure. So I'll draw on some insights from a report that we, re or a series of reports that we recently did for the Chief Public Health Officer's Office to inform their annual report that's coming up in the fall. Uh, and in that, we look for any evidence, and in particular empirical evidence, evidence about what went well and what could have gone better in Canada, as well as in a few select other countries. And, you know, there's lots of detail in there, but I'll go through some of the key ones. So in terms of what went well, what we're seeing recently is that those who moved early to implement COVID proof of vaccination and uh, have had increases in vaccine uptake. So that seems to be working quite well for those who are starting to, starting to move with it. So we've seen it in France, now in BC, in Quebec, big uptakes in, vac in vaccines. Um, the management of um, PPE, medical devices, really improved in the second and third ways. There were a number of lessons learned from the first one to manage supply. Um, we, we also found that those who implemented rigorous public health measures um, early and with a kind of coordinated action was really effective at preventing and managing outbreaks. Um, and, and then also in the long-term care sector, when approaches to using kind of external infection protection and control teams, single site work policies and collaboration between sectors 
we're more effective at managing those outbreaks and getting crisis management under control. Um, and so ultimately it kind of comes down to, you know, it, it was swift and coordinated action, uh, both within a jurisdiction and across jurisdictions, especially, especially in federated states, uh, uh, countries like Canada, where you have to coordinate across many different provinces and territories. Okay, uh, what about other countries? Where did you see kind of these best practices you've just mentioned? And where did other governments fall flat, you know, providing teachable moments for us, uh, what to do and what not to do? Yeah, well, it's a good question. And I think one of them is that, and this has been consistent in a number of countries uh, based on what we've found, is that a, a lack of transparency and communications. We saw this in countries like Australia, the UK and US, you know, really contributed to undermining public trust. Uh, and I think we've seen that to some extent in Canada as well. Um, it, you know, that emerges from using kind of vague and indeterminate language, and it, it makes people unsure of the actions being taken and what they can trust. Um, and then domestically also, where we kind of fell flat, you know, everyone knows about the crisis in the long-term care sector, it, which really emerged from kind of failure to address long-standing issues in that sector that just made that crisis even worse when the pandemic hit. We, we had, you know, a number of people in single rooms, shared washrooms, which made it very hard to control outbreaks and manage them as we went along. Um, another one that was kind of consistent across countries that we found is contact tracing apps that underperformed due to low uptake. And sometimes that was from a concern around surveillance and privacy. Um, and then in Canada, we had you know, limited human resource capacity and kind of unclear guidelines around using that contract tracing. And as we know, if we're not doing good contract tracing, then it's hard to know where the sources of infection are coming from. And when we're not able to control those sources of infection and address, the, and address the outbreaks, then we have the reproduction rate creeping upwards. And then we have uh, waves of infection taking over. So contact tracing and coordinated action are really quite important for that. So in other words, if you can't, uh, if you don't have the contact tracing uh, data in, it's very much, it's harder to control this and perpetuates yeah. the waves we've been seeing. And I think that combined with conveying sort of delayed action, if it's not rolled out in a timely way, then you're not going to get on top of things. So we, what we do know is that the virus replicates fast, and we know that especially with the Delta variant. So, you know, swift action and coordinated action using contact tracing is really important. And, and the other thing I'd add that came up in some of our reports is you know, the lack of collection of race-based data and, and more comprehensive data to know where infections are coming up and having the data to be able to respond to that in real time and to customize our, our approaches based on the communities that it's affecting most. Well, I think Chandrima, hopefully you'll be able to address that when we get to your questions and, and maybe I'll talk about the spatial inequities as well that I think are unique to a country like Canada versus the UK where you just have this massive geography and uh, coordination of patchwork systems that uh, that Mike has alluded to. Um, can we move on to, let's say, the, the, the economic and social policies, which is what you're talking about and the very real impact that those uh, have when they integrate into overall pandemic response. Uh, Mike, again, given your kind of superpowers and striking the balance between mitigating economic costs and protecting public health, what are the examples of positive social and economic policies that were taken? Yeah, I think some of them related to job protection schemes and other economic supports. I think we saw those really swiftly implemented in the country. And to be able to, when Canada used the existing infrastructure to deliver the, can the Canada Emergency Response side of it, it kind of, it just supported that su successful rollout and the financial resilience of Canadians throughout the pandemic. So I think without that swift rollout, you might have seen a much bigger economic impact on individuals. I think there still was an impact, but at least it was to some extent blunted through that uh, swift action. Um, and it was targeted well for those who are employed in industries that were severely affected by lockdowns and low wage workers. Um, and then in addition, the, the wage subsidy program was provided to employers as well. So I think those are some key examples. There are some provincial level ones like uh, how British Columbia established a rental supplement and kind of other housing supports to be able to address some of the housing challenges that emerged during the pandemic. But there was also, you know, to some extent, and this is across the country, insufficient to be able to address the many housing concerns that were exacerbated during the pandemic. I think we already had a housing crisis and then it got even worse during the pandemic. Um, 
And then there are some other key findings from our reports were that, uh, you know, the number of per the percentage of women participating in the labor force dropped significantly uh, because of lack of affordable childcare, for example. And I think that's another example of a, a policy area where, you know, that was affordable childcare is a longstanding issue and just got even worse during the pandemic when people are having to juggle so many different things. Yeah, I think um, I think we did see that a lot of the gains that women made in the workplace uh, uh, stepped back and it'll be interesting to see whether they move forward again. So obviously this, this whole kind of mosaic of uh, policy decision making issues that need to somehow be coordinated to better you know, society in general in the pandemic response. So that sounds like a very, very uh, tall order. Uh, given the way that uh, Canada is put together with provincial versus municipal versus uh, federal policy making, and hopefully we'll be able to dig a little bit more into that with recommendations as we move on with the uh, discussion. I would like to actually move over, you know, when we talk about lockdowns, maybe we could uh, kind of um, segue into that when we talk about the timeliness of lockdowns based on the evidence. We're now, I think it's safe to say, and mark me if I'm wrong in this, a lot of people are seeing a fourth wave here. We believe we're in a fourth wave. There's some new fourth wave data coming out that's not conclusive that these tend to be, they have been shown to be two month cycles in a lot of places, but they also have shown not to be. So uh, I don't know how people prepare for this beyond the modeling and everything that you could recommend today. But uh, Chandrima, I'd like to take it over to you and just talk about lockdowns and which populations are most affected by the economic and social policies put into place uh, or that have been put into place in Canada during this pandemic responses where people are just kind of learning as they go. Yeah, I think, yeah I think as, you know, sort of uh, Mike uh, uh, brought up uh, low wage workers often in precarious, you know, employment in what is considered essential services, you know, sanitation, manufacturing, warehouses, you know, healthcare, uh, healthcare uh, those in the food supply chain. And these workers are usually women, recent immigrants and racialized Canadians. And these workplaces, as we know, are typically more crowded, you know, maintain le less of uh, safety precautions and offer limited benefits, whether it's sick pay or sick leave. And so not surprisingly, racialized minorities have experienced higher rates of uh, COVID-19 disease, hospitalization and deaths. Uh, some of the largest outbreak breaks, um, even if you, in Canada, have occurred in long-term care facilities and uh, meatpacking industries, for instance, you know, the Alberta Cargill yeah. one, you might remember, yeah. with over 1,500 infections. And, of, and in that particular, uh, you know, meatpacking plant, 70% of the uh, uh, employees are of Filipino descent. And we also know in terms of, you know, personal support workers, large proportion of, uh, you know, Filipino descent. So data suggests that, you know, not just, you know, uh, Alberta, but also in Ontario, you know, immigrants represent about 25% of the population, but 43.5% of COVID-19 cases and most of which are racialized minorities. So yeah, so I would say low wage earners and most of them, you know, seem to be racialized minorities, yeah. So as a storyteller, can you connect the dots for us? Because what I'm hearing is that the congregant work settings and which have been, I think, largely reported on during the pandemic brought to the surface and also long-term care facilities with racialized minorities, uh, lower hourly wages, quite often, especially in long-term care homes, they cannot uh, support themselves or their families on the wages they earn. They don't make a living wage. And so that in congregant settings, a lot of the people who work there who are uh, exposed in a different way to COVID are also taking public transit because statistically they are less likely to own their own vehicle. Uh, and so it, the, connecting the dots there, it's, this is a really, really important part of the puzzle for uh, provinces, cities, towns, the country to solve. So can you just maybe just drill down a little bit more on how the existing sociopolitical context exacerbate the effects of COVID-19 on racialized communities and why it matters so much to get this right. 
Yeah, absolutely. Because of course, it's it is you know as you pointed out, and as you know, data has shown you know it's immigration and labor market uh, policies, right, that have resulted in the overrepresentation of racialized immigrants, newcomers, migrant workers in so-called you know we call them essential services, but basically low-paying and precarious jobs. Uh, so many of these individuals, you know, as you said, you know, personal support workers in long-term care homes or you know meatpacking industries or manufacturing manufacturing because of the lower pay are also then forced into tighter living spaces and taking you know public transit uh, etc which put them at a higher risk of COVID-19 uh, infection so if you look at public health uh, Ontario data it shows that the greater Toronto area most of the areas that have reported the largest rate of positive COVID-19 cases are neighborhoods with you know majority of the population comprising you know racialized minorities recent you know immigrants low income uh, earners in poor housing you know substandard housing and many of them in you know in uh, essential sort of services if you take the example of you know lockdowns for instance well lockdowns don't have the same uh, impact on everyone right if the libraries and community centers uh, close down what happens to those who do not have access? access to computers or cell phones? How do you even book yourself a vaccine shot, right? How do you know where the vaccines are available? If you're elderly or disabled and you depend on a neighbor or a family member for groceries and suddenly you, those folks are not accessible, right? What happens to you? Residents in congested apartments, you can go out for walks or those living in multi-generational homes. And we saw a lot of data around that, that you know, putting elderly, um, family members at risk. You know, if you think of students in universities, if you're fighting over one family computer that now everyone needs access to, right? Uh, and then the final thing I would say in terms of, you know, social and, you know, policies, I would say is health, you know, represents both physical and mental well-being, right? It's not just the absence of disease. So if you look at the rise of anti-Asian racism that we witnessed during COVID-19 in Canada and York University and UBC researchers, you know, did a survey and they found that, you um, during COVID-19 and post sort of, you know, the early uh, months of the pandemic, there is a much larger increase in the mental health issues of Asian Canadians compared to, uh, you know, other, other Canadians. So, of course, you know, I mean, we can say that, you know, this is a moment, you know, we've never seen a pandemic like this, at least not in our lifetimes. This is a reflection of fear and uncertainty, which it is. But there is also a long history of legalized racism in immigration policy and public health policies right from the early 19th century when you have the first Chinese workers coming into Canada and 2000 SARS epidemic that made this you know, quick association of, health, of infectious disease with the Chinese race and Chinese lifestyle possible. So I believe that without understanding the historical association um, of infectious disease with the Chinese and the long history of legalized racism, we cannot make sense of what, you know, University of Alberta and the Angus Reid Institute has said that, you know, there is a shadow pandemic of racism in Canada. So I think we have to acknowledge that, you know, inconvenient history. Uh, we have to educate ourselves. We have to unlearn our biases and informed by the lived experiences of affected communities, we need to show long-term commitment to, you know, addressing these uh, inequities and vulnerabilities that have surfaced, you know, higher up in, in, during the pandemic. I think this is, uh, Stephen, this is in your wheelhouse. Uh, so segueing over to you, let, can we just start with which strategies that you think would be the most effective to building equity considerations into research and decision making? Yeah, so the, the first uh, and most important thing is recognizing that it's really important that we do so in building in uh, equity considerations, because if it's not built in from the beginning, it doesn't happen or it doesn't happen as well as it needs to. And so one thing that we are seeing globally among different research funders around the world is increasing attention to policies around funding, because we know that's a very helpful lever to encourage or incentivize um, researchers to begin to be thinking about these issues for those who are not primarily thinking about it. And of course, um, for example, in Canada, there's many uh, leading researchers at the very edge of thinking about equity considerations. But um, thinking about, for example, um, requiring that if people are applying for grants to be 
uh, applying a sex and gender-based analysis, for example, increasingly thinking also about other intersecting factors that affect people's lived experiences, whether it's race, socioeconomic background, uh, cultural heritage, all of which very much determine and influence uh, people's lived experiences, as well as the way that they interact with the rest of, of society and how society uh, imposes obligations and expectations and consequences on people, just like how what, uh, Chand what Chandrima was just talking about. I think then from a policy perspective, um, globally, there have been efforts to try to think about this as well, um, but um, certainly uh, lots of work uh, that can be done to make it better for future. Because I would say looking globally, there is no jurisdiction around the world that ensured that its response to this pandemic was equitable. There were challenges in every jurisdiction around the world. Yes, and I wonder if, I mean, there's such power Wonderful tools at your disposal now with a lot of uh, quantitative data. But what I'm hearing from you is you have to be able to discern where the qualitative data can be applied uh, in these. And I'm just thinking from a lay person's perspective of you know how algorithms were made. They're made as a systemic approach to society in general, whereas those undercurrents of uh, gender uh, biases, uh, ethnic biases, socioeconomic biases, are not baked into the program. So, you know, data in, data out, garbage in, garbage out, programming in, programming out. What I'm hearing is that, that what you're seeing is that these sensibilities and considerations need to be in at, when we get out of the gate, uh, not at the end of the race. So we I, can, I think that's that right? I think that's right. And you mentioned uh, algorithms. Uh, that's something I'm quite passionate about. So, you know, when um, there's so many examples out there where when we don't think about equity and we just design uh, an algorithm to automate processes or draw in data, we can accidentally import racism and bias of all kinds into yes. those algorithms. And if they're built in from the design, they're going to be. Uh, resulting in racist or discriminatory behavior uh, on the outside. And yet it doesn't have to be like that. I'm also quite excited about the role that algorithms uh, and AI and machine learning can play in actually combating racism, combating all forms of discrimination, uh, because it gives us potentially another tool to be seeking out ways and uh, of, of identifying and addressing uh, these challenges. I think the key, as you mentioned, is that they have to be designed for that. And most uh, for example, computer scientists or those working at tech companies are not at the forefront of their minds designing things to meet the needs of populations facing conditions of marginalization. They're mostly designing these things to sell to the, the average person because that's the largest market out there. Now, there is no average person. That's one thing to debunk. But more importantly, if we really care about equity and health equity and ensuring that all members of our society can get through challenges like pandemics, we need to be thinking about and designing both the research as well as policies and interventions to make sure it's serving everybody's needs. So what I'm hearing from you is that business has one set of goals and objectives, but governments, policymakers, decision makers in that sphere do have the opportunity to build it from the ground up, get that foundation solidified, and then everything flows out of that in a way that does overcome these inequities that we've seen so far. Is that I think Fair. that's right. I think there's lots of opportunities that governments around the world have, have been starting to pursue uh, in yeah. order to move in that direction. But uh, Heather, I wouldn't want to let industry off the hook, of course. I mean, we need industry and we need, we need leaders to be stepping up in all sectors of society to say that yeah. our society right now is fundamentally unfair. And yeah. we need innovations, we need new ideas, we need new actions and programs, new technologies, new products that are going to help us get through all of that. And so I, I don't want to give any one sector a free pass. We need industry. And, and ideally, there should be an ability to make money in industry by simultaneously advancing equity. And I think some of the examples, particularly in a healthcare context, for example, that we see around the world, no healthcare system wants to just import AI clinical algorithms or electronic health records if they're going to simultaneously be importing racism and other forms of discrimination along with it. So ideally, we can be in a situation where, and this pandemic, I think, has really highlighted this, that there are lots of opportunities for doing well financially are also opportunities for industry to do the right thing. Okay, so they're not mutually exclusive.
Uh, so let's get to the rapid response and how, like what global mechanisms do you think, because I'm what I'm hearing, okay, so we have the policy issue and we have now the mechanisms of how the communication at a global level is managed. So we could have rapid response and ideally collaboration because we now know that the global village is just that, it's a global village. And you can be in Wuhan in a lab, you can be in a wet market, whatever the original source of what people think this virus came from, without evidence, we don't really know. Um, but it's it, it doesn't matter where it comes from, it's going to be in your backyard in a lightning, uh, lightning speed, right? Like that's the village we live in. So what would be your recommendations on that front, seeing how what works and what doesn't work? Yeah, Heather, thanks for the, uh, the question. You know, uh, thinking about a pandemic in a national context doesn't make sense anymore. As you said, viruses don't carry passports. They, they just, they, tra they, they transmit wherever people and products go. And as a result, uh, we need to be thinking and acting globally to address a pandemic. And I think when you're asking about what, what sort of actions need to happen, what was clear is before this pandemic, we knew, people who study pandemics like myself, we knew the world was not ready for the next pandemic. One need only look to the most recent outbreak of, um, of Ebola that happened before it. In a sense, it was uh, showcasing, here's the, the rough nature of our global arrangements for addressing a pandemic. And certainly the way that we, the world responded to the Ebola outbreak in West Africa was not confidence boosting. And so what it really highlights, Heather, is the need for very clear rules around what countries can and, and should be doing when the inevitable pandemic like COVID-19, but also what comes next when that happens, uh, very clear rules about what's gonna happen as well as strong institutions to help mobilize a, a response. I think one thing we've seen over the last two decades is a gradual uh, defunding of the World Health Organization, for example. I mean, this is the world's agency to mount and lead and coordinate a global response to health threats like a pandemic. Yet over time, its budget has become increasingly um, uh, minimized to a point where there's very little flex such that when a pandemic hits, the first thing WHO has to do is go around and try to seek funding to support efforts, can't even start to act. Now, of course, they, they mobilized and I think WHO did um, a really great job considering the circumstances but it's considering the circumstances. The WHO that member states have designed is not the World Health Organization that the world needs. And that was known before the pandemic. We need to fix it after COVID-19. Okay, how, do you, how would you fix it? If you were able, if you were in a position to enforce this, how would yeah. you fix it? Well, if I had a magic wand and I could do one thing, I would uh, immediately uh, double the World Health Organization's budget. Uh, essentially, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's operating budget is something like a couple billion dollars per year, uh, which of course, a lot, that's a lot of money, but when you spread it over uh, 194 member states, it's actually not that much. It's probably that organization, despite its challenges, and we can talk at length about that, I've written about that, um, it is probably one of the greatest value for money that any citizen around the world gets from making that kind of investment. And so that would be my number one thing. The second is um, we need uh, a new legal instruments that, um, be, that are much clearer that have compliance mechanisms that ensure that we can count on and know what other countries are going to do in response to a pandemic. Right now, we do have a series of rules. It's called the International Health Regulations. They are legally binding, but within days of this outbreak of COVID-19 being, um, being known to the world, countries were already violating that legally binding international agreement. Uh, so to the point where basically every single country is currently in violation of that treaty, which for me and, and many other global health lawyers like me really highlights, there's probably some updating that needs to happen with that instrument. And the first thing to update with those rules is to give them teeth. Right now, it's a statement of norms and requirements and there's no consequences if countries break it. So as a result, countries around the world have broken it. 
Well, if I have any sympathy for policymakers, uh, uh, I think there's a lot of triage that goes on, right? And you you have to address things that are immediate. And when there's not a, a global emergency or global crisis, you're you're doing the work that needs to be done right in front of you. So this kind of veers into two different areas to me, if I understood you correctly. And I think it really applies to scientific science diplomacy and then scientific research and collaboration and communication within the community. It strikes me from everything I've read and seen that scientists are a pretty tight group and that your purpose when it's science driven, you're kind of all on the same page. But I imagine there's healthy uh, competition within that. <laughs> and, and people just break the way people break. It doesn't matter where you're from. We all are predictable in a certain way to how we behave. And then there's also the diplomacy. Uh, when you're talking about enforce enforcement, things with no teeth are really hard to, uh, like it's hard to, I guess, just enforce these. It's that simple. And so what you have to do is get buy-in from companies, right? Like there's money is one issue, um, but the buy-in and the ability to stay true to what you've committed to during a time of crisis strikes me as being very difficult because you're going to fold in and protect your flank. Uh, so um, I'm just wondering if all of you, like anybody else have a, a, a sense of how you would recommend to the people listening today who are probably somehow involved in the industry, policymaking, decision making, how they can go about this, how you would approach it from your lens. Uh, maybe we just do a quick round and then we have some questions and, and Q&A from the audience. Um, and I love your passion, Stephen, clearly. <laughs> like, this like, is coming on, you know. Uh, Chandrima, how would, you, how would you approach that in terms of uh, collaborative uh, diplomatic um, buy-in on a global basis, uh, uh, recognizing that it's in everybody's self-interest to actually do this? I think, you know, I think, you know, uh, Stephen brought up a number of things, but I think I would add to it community engagement, which he briefly referred to. So I think the buy-in has to come in from the community and it has to be driven by the community. And that is critical for embedding health equity into, you know, COVID-19 planning, response and recovery, because uh, equity informed responses can be amplified by tapping into not just researchers, but also communities and community organizations. And that would allow governments to find out about the struggles of particular, you know, uh, uh, communities, how to effectively reach out to particular groups. And I'll just quickly give you an example, very quick, I know we're running out of time, of the South Asia, Asian COVID task force, right? So the initial response was that South Asians are not taking, are, are vaccine hesitant, they are not taking the vaccines. And we soon find, found out that the messaging was not reaching them, right? So these are populations, many of them truck drivers, etc. So we're talking of you know, lower income group South Asians who don't listen to CDC, who don't listen to CTV. They don't read Toronto Star. So as soon as you had community uh, you know, public health messages being delivered in their languages, you suddenly had an uptake in terms of vaccination. So it's not, you know, what was read as vaccine hesitancy was, you know, about reaching the communities in the la language that they understand. So I think, you know, so that kind of, you know, tapping into resources and community knowledge would be key. So uh, when, you know, for people here in policy, uh, I guess everybody acknowledges that all politics is local, but what I'm hearing is that all science is local. And that word of mouth, the good old fashioned way of spreading the word is probably still the most effective way. And what I'm hearing from you is that you have leaders within communities who, uh, when you communicate effectively a message uh, that has takes in language, uh, cultural sensi sensitivities into account, and then get buy-in from leaders in communities, then it starts spreading out that way. So you go from the bottom up as opposed to the top down. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. So it's a matter of trust, right? So if you have leaders yeah. in the community, doctors who look like you giving the vaccine, there is a yes. bit of trust if you are the hesitant person, right? Yes. I think it's fair to say for decades, we've seen that with women. Right. When we tried to get gender equity, you needed to have women hearing things from women or women having someone that they could speak to. And now we just like, you know, migrate that out to every every community that's out there. It's the same thing is what I'm hearing. And that has been well covered and well researched and documented for decades. So, um, Mike, what would be your uh, magic wand recommendation for this? 
Yeah, mine it relates more to what I'll call the evidence ecosystem. So if you're a decision maker, you have to consider a number of different things. For example, like what do you what should you be paying attention to? What options might you have at your disposal to address it? How might you implement those options? How do you monitor and evaluate over time? That requires a lot of different forms of evidence. And what we know from the pandemic is that researchers and decision makers around the world teamed up very quickly and adapted very quickly uh, to use evidence to respond to issues. But we also know is that there was a lack of coordination in doing that, and there was some imbalance in the types of evidence that, that, that was used. So I would like to see a more coordinated evidence ecosystem. So for example, at the start of the pandemic, we didn't need 12 groups around the world doing an evidence synthesis of how effective masks were. We needed one group to do one really good evidence synthesis, right. and the other teams could have been deployed to do any number of evidence syntheses. What we also know is that decision makers were more likely to encounter things like data analytics, modeling, expert opinions, jurisdictional scans about what other countries are doing. Those all have a role to play, but if we're looking to only those things, then we're kind of seeing uh, things like chasing the new single study instead of it seeing, seeing it contextualized within the global pool of evidence. What we know is that when we pool all the studies together, we have greater confidence in what the end, what the end result findings are going to be. So if we can achieve better balance across looking to evidence syntheses, as well as the data analytics and modeling and other forms, then that would go a long way to informing decision making and using evidence. That's, uh, I think, a really important component to this. And, and I think we see that it just sounds like there would be exponential impact. 12 groups studying the same thing versus 12 groups studying 12 different things. And then that going out and multiplying, the multiplier effect would mean that we have that kind of horizon line vision on all of the elements that feed back into it, as opposed to that narrow uh, approach, linear approach that that has been taken exactly in the past. so it's about kind of using everyone's comparative advantages like people have yes. different areas of expertise and then everyone goes farther faster in responding to the, the pandemic with evidence if we're able to do that well i hate to use the uh the you know the expression we're stronger together but i think uh what i'm hearing from all of you is that we're really stronger together and there's just no way around it. Uh, there are a few more questions, but we have some questions from the audience. And I think it's really important to acknowledge those uh, because it, it reflects what people are, are thinking here. Um, I'm just gonna read them if you can bear with me. Uh, uh, and then perhaps uh, whoever thinks is most appropriate can address them. So when looking at different provinces, it seems that some had less restrictive public health measures, but lower overall case numbers and deaths. How is this explained? Anyone, or is that well, a slice in time? It's uh, the it's um the well the guy I think the question is a good one now although the question uh, could also be framed the opposite direction right so it could be yeah. uh, and it might then become uh, less uh, surprised why is the question could have been framed why is it that those jurisdictions that had fewer cases ended up with having fewer restrictions and then um, that might actually uh, make a whole lot of sense so I, I think it's a it's a great question it but it depends on um, which order? And that's a question that has been faced uh, actually in societies around the world. Um, uh, different, you could ask the same thing about different countries. Um, uh, I think what Mike pointed to earlier, and Mike, you should speak to this, it's about in your evidence review, really highlighting those countries that acted uh, fast and acted um, vigorously uh, were able to address and had different than trajectories of this pandemic than other jurisdictions. Yeah, it's a great point, Stephen. It, it, what called to mind for me was the so-called Atlantic bubble, where they really restricted anything coming in or out of that region. And as a result, they had far fewer cases than uh, much of the rest of the country. And, and I think, you know, they acted quickly and they restricted access and they, as a result, had to implement you know, fewer public health measures at the individual level. They, so they stayed open longer because they were able to quickly control the number of cases coming into that region to begin with. And then you see, as in contrast, in the Greater Toronto area, I mean, it's just a completely different context, as Shandrima was talking about. We have many you know, people working in close quarters inside. There's far more people, and it, it's a much different context in terms of preventing transmission. Is there, I'm just wondering, and it's a little bit on a sidebar on this, but I have friends in Toronto and PEI who had completely different experiences. To your point, in PEI, there were hardly any restrictions. 
So when they talk to relatives and family in Toronto and area and said, oh, we went out for dinner with our friends, people would get twitchy about it. No, don't go out for dinner with your friends. But it's because it was a completely different experience. And then that has a mental health impact on people, right? 18, 19 months into the pandemic. Um, so are, is like, how would you address that in terms of uh, policy and decision making? I mean, it seems like you're almost creating a domino effect of potential negative outcomes, or maybe Chandrima, this is something for you. Uh, when you have communities that are really restricted for a long period of time, already disadvantaged, and now you've got the mental health issues on top of that, because there just seems like there's no escape. Is this something that needs to be uh, brought in on that kind of horizon line that uh, that we've been talking about? Yeah, I think so. It's not just physical health, right, but also, you know, mental health and feelings of well-being. And I think Stephen, you know, brought that earlier that, uh, the you know, that we have to understand the differential impacts of the pan pandemic on different population groups and using an intersectional approach, right, so that we can look at the overlapping factors of whether it's race or class or income or ability, right, or geography that result in different health outcomes, right? As you said, you know, this, even the spatial differences, uh, right? What might it mean to for your mental health if you are at home alone versus with too many people? That's also a different kind of an issue, right? Trying to, you know, do take care of your children or maybe elderly family members and the anxieties around that, right? That, you know, am I putting these family members at risk? Uh, so it's, it's, you know, having that understanding that it's not a one shoe fits all, right? We, we keep talking about it, but I think it needs to be hammered into our understanding that we have to see that things, you know, impact people differently. And there were so many different factors. Well, there are two points that I think you're underscoring there. One is like there's uh, in terms of broadband access, which was alluded to earlier, broadband act is uh, act as affordable um, internet access, high quality access. So then there's uh, in remote and rural communities, they can have a completely different experience than uh, people in urban communities, even though they probably have more of a, a, a healthier environment in terms of space but they have less access to information and tools. And the second thing is kids are going back to school this week. When you talk about anxieties, what I'm seeing everywhere is parents are just like, whoa, you know, we're not at herd immunity. Um, what, are the, what are the risks? What are the downside risks to our family if we don't get this under control? So it sounds like all of these things, the intersectional component of this is something that has to be solved. Um, uh, before we get to the big, closer question, <laughs> lightning round. Um, I would just like a, a, the two more questions here. Uh, one is about public trust of national and world leaders. It seems to have taken a hit during this pandemic. I don't know if that's accurate. I think it's gone, uh, it, it depends on the country and some of the outcomes, but even within those leaders, individual leaders have seen ups and downs in their um, popularity given on where things are at in the pandemic. Um, so with this question continuing on, systemic issues have been highlighted and major inequities have been put in the spotlight leading to many Canadians, uh, uh, a disbelief of health measures being implemented. What should can be done to rebuild some public confidence and tackle that hesitancy? It's kind of the million dollar question, isn't it? Let's let's have everyone have a go at this. If you can do it in a minute, uh, a minute each, that would be great. Maybe. Oh, sorry, Stephen. I think. Go ahead, Stephen. Okay. No, I um, I think so, Heather. I think uh, I think that is the million dollar question. But you know, these are broader questions than just a pandemic. I mean, before this pandemic, there there was already the rise of misinformation. I mean, now we're talking about it in the context of vaccine information. Beforehand, we were talking about it in the context of elections. Right in terms of the U.S. election and um, uh, different things that happened around that, so it's not like it's a new phenomenon. What this pandemic, I think, has done is provided a focusing event, whereby we have seen the consequences and costs of inequality in our society. We've seen the costs and consequences of having structures that don't work for everybody. We've seen the costs and consequences of not having made investments in our public health system or in our scientific systems, uh, as Mike said, the evidence ecosystem to make sure that we're able to respond. This isn't, and I'm not, even, I'm not talking about the Canadian context, I'm talking really about the global context. This is a challenge that's shared by societies around the world. 
And the hope would be that a pandemic like this, where millions of people have died, that the as a silver lining, as a way to honor those people who've died and have been affected, would be to correct these underlying challenges that have long existed from the before the pandemic, but for which the real costs and consequences have been illuminated for everyone to see. Let's hope that happens. And, and that leads to the last question is, how can we address those? Chandrima. Yeah, I was going to say that, you know, we have to collect evidence on the disparity in the effectiveness of certain policy, as well as, you know, unintended consequences of particular policies. And there has to be an openness to uh, collective learning and changing policies, right? Because, and so I would add my voice to the call that many have made about the need to collect, you know, more demographic data on COVID-19 health and race, along with em immigration status to enable targeted policy interventions that can attend to the uh, to the hierarchies of vulnerabilities within, you know, communities to uh, improve COVID-19 outcomes. So, right, as Stephen said, that the gaps were there, but they have surfaced further right now. And let's not forget those gaps, that these are, you know, long-standing issues uh, that has just sort of, you know, boiled at a moment of global health crisis. So Mike, I'm going to leave it with you to close on that note, because you are the evidence-based expert. <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's an excellent point. It really comes down to making sure that those of us who are producing evidence on the supply side are making sure that those who have to make decisions have the evidence they need at their fingertips and being responsive and working with them in partnership um, in a balanced way and getting the data we need, as Shandrima was talking about, all forms of data, including demographic data, so we can respond and adjust as we go. And that's a big part of it is being able to adjust. We learn things, new, we learn new things every day, and we need data and evidence to be able to guide us in how to adapt as we learn more. Well, thank you for that uh, to all three of you. I hope that uh, people who have been watching today have uh, some key takeaways that they can apply. I personally have learned a lot and there is some actionable advice in here. So uh, hopefully that will translate out and transmit out. Uh, so thank you so much for weighing in on how you think uh, government responses can be, have been uh, going along and can be improved in the pandemic. And on that note, I would like to hand it over to Dr. Jerry Wright, the lead global nexus for pandemics and biological threats. Over to you, Jerry. Well, thank you so much, uh, Heather, and thanks uh, to the speakers. Um, you know, uh, really, quite, I've been on the edge of my seat watching this, um, and the really, really impressive uh, work here. And it just goes to show you how complex these um, these issues are. We think, you know, we think it's 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 an infection, or we've heard people say it's a it's a cold, but it reaches much more into society than that. We, exposes all of these historical vulnerabilities and existing inequities. And if we don't understand the, these and we don't uh, uh, work very hard based on evidence to address them, then I think we're, we're doomed to, to, uh, to repeat what's happening. So when we started um, the McMaster's Global Nexus for Pandemics and Biological Threats Initiative, really with a goal of trying to enhance uh, our response and our resilience and our readiness to deal with these big problems, and uh, what is absolutely essential for this is collaboration. And as you've seen uh, here, this, uh, the scope of research and scholarship that is needed to address these, these challenges are really significant. And if you were watching our previous forum on testing, then you saw yet another aspect of, of uh, the essential, uh, essentialness of coordinating across disciplines and, and across areas. And so when we built uh, the, the Nexus, we really wanted to ensure that we had uh, our opportunities to collaborate with groups like the Lung Health Foundation um, through these kinds of policy fora and, and other uh, aspects of it. So we're really trying to bring uh, um, experts to, to you to, to, so you can understand the challenges that, we're, that are facing, uh, people who are actually on the front lines doing the research and, and, and responding to, to this pandemic. Uh, what you saw today, of course, is that is that the folks here and and, and at CIHR are, are really leading the way in developing uh, and deploying solutions in all of the areas of the COVID nineteen response. And so, we're really keen um, to continue this work and, and continue to investigate the broader social implications of the pandemic. So, um, together with the uh, Lung Health Foundation's reach and track record for advocacy, we're absolutely certain that we can advance 
the recommendations coming out of these um, discussions uh, for Canadian and not and international decision makers, because um, we have to strengthen public health based on evidence, based on our understanding of, of expertise. So this has really been a fantastic um, forum today. I really want to thank the speakers again and, and the, the Lung Health Foundation for putting this together with us. Uh, our next one uh, is part of the, uh, the um, this series of three fora is on September 15th at 2 p.m. Eastern uh, Standard Time. And this one was going to be on uh, vaccine development and rollout. Uh, top of mind for sure, uh, as we heard today about uh, and yet another um, vaccine mandate uh, uh, policy that's happening in this province, in the province of Ontario. So we encourage you to register if you haven't done so already. Uh, thanks again for everyone for joining and, and we'll see you at the next um, forum uh, between the Canada's Global Nexus and uh, the Lung Health Foundation. Thank you, everybody.